and kind of last minute prep for this. Uh, uh, we, we will be kicking off Jonah chapter 1 tonight. So let's begin reading through it, and then we'll pray, and then we'll kind of go back through it. Jonah 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness, wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you? that the sea may be calm for us, for the sea was growing more temptu temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that the, this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous. tempestuous. <laughs> We'll go with that. Not against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this, this record, this testimony of Jonah, the Lord of uh, just the the truthfulness of how our walk is sometimes. I just pray, Lord, that you would illuminate your scriptures for us, Lord, and help us, God, to um, apply, God, some of the principles and, and um, your spirit would convict us and convince us of our, our need to um, maybe quit running, maybe quit sleeping. Pray, God, that you would just bless this time. I thank you, good Lord, for these men. Uh, I pray, Lord, for the women as they study, and I pray, for, Lord, for the, the young uh, the young men and women who are studying the youth, that you would, uh, that your spirit would stir tonight, Lord, that people would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Jonah, uh, the book is... Uh, considered to be autobiographical we don't we, we don't know that for sure but there's no reason not to believe that to be the case it is written in the third person that's not an unusual thing for, for 
for this time period or autobiographical. Um, so when you think about that, what all was written here, how, what a poor light Jonah was put in, recognize that he's writing that about himself. He's, he was the one who wrote this out. He's the one pointing back to, look at this, look, look, at, look at what I did. And he wasn't uh, glorifying himself in any way whatsoever. And so it's the, the evidence of that, or, the, or I guess the, the inference of that is, is that God obviously got some time past these four chapters that we have the record of here. God got to Jonah's heart and, and <clears throat> Jonah repented of, of uh, we really don't see that all that much in, in Jonah. But he really, even though God forced him to go to Nineveh, <coughs> he didn't want to go. He still had a <coughs> terrible attitude about it. Still had a terrible attitude towards uh, the Ninevites. Still didn't want God to forgive that city. And so, some some time post this, uh, God got a hold of Jonah's heart and, and brought him to a point of repentance. Um, based on the evidence that this this was him writing this book. Uh, so, this takes place early part of the eighth century BC, seven seven. 90-ish, 780-ish, somewhere around that time frame uh, that this takes place. Uh, Nineveh was a, a very great city, as described later in this book. It was, it was, and that is not necessarily talking about size, though it was a large city. Uh, it's also talking about influence and power and, and reach as far as what they were able to do. They were, the, it, was, it was the Assyrian capital at the time. Uh, and it was, they were known to be very, very cruel uh, in, in their practices and, and very, just a wicked, kind of a wicked people that, that, that uh, rejected anything good, it seemed. And so um, that's kind of the setting of this. They had been uh, quite cruel towards Israel specifically. Um, and, and so there's, it's kind of an, you can kind of understand why Jonah's like, what? I mean, think of think of your worst enemy. Think of the people that you just think are awful and evil, and have been awful and evil to you. And God's calling Jonah to say, hey, go to them, go to them, go to that person, go to this worst person who's ever who you could even think of unrepentant they've not changed they're not they're not there's not already a better relationship that he's sending Jonah to it's just go right and so uh, it's a it's a human thing completely human thing this response that Jonah had and so and now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Ammon Amite, saying arise I can't even get to my sorry I don't have notes so I couldn't figure out got a new printer so I can print out my notes. So I'm using my my phone here. Sorry, uh, he was from Gath Hefer. So, uh, he, so we, we see that in Second uh, Kings fourteen twenty five. God I'm talking about not talking about God. He's actually talking about. Azariah, no, no, Am, 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 Amaziah, sorry, Azariah's father. Amaziah had, is what this, the context of this scripture, the Second Kings 14, 25. He, Amaziah, restored the t territory of Israel from the entrance of, of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amite, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. Um, so Jonah was a prophet. We yet we don't have any of his prophetic. We have a mention here of here something that was restored based on the 
prophetic word that God gave through him, but we don't have have any of his uh, prophetic writings or, or sayings or anything. So his his life was more the example rather than his words of of uh, prophecy. All right. Let's read. Uh, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of. You may have an idea how to pronounce that. Amitai. 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 Amitai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So, um, uh, so he, he, he was called most likely from Gath Heifer. Gath Heifer was kind of, if you can imagine, you know, the, the, uh, Mediterranean Sea, kind of this oval here, you know, Joppa's right here, inland and north east of it is Gath Heifer, then northeast a little bit more is um, Nineveh. So it's, you know, he's, he's here at Gath Heifer, God tells him to go, it's not that, it's not that far, obviously they're walking so it's a good distance, but it's not, it's not a huge, huge trek to go up to Nineveh, is what he's calling to do. But instead what he does is he comes down to Joppa, finds a boat going to Tarshish and pays for the fee to get, the, to get on there and go. So to understand though, at that time, so, so if you look at biblical maps, a lot of people will put Tarshish in Spain. The reality is it's probably actually England. And so it's, it, it, if you, you know, you got the Mediterranean Sea here, I should have had a picture, sorry. Mediterranean Sea here, and over on this side of it, you have Spain, and you have the uh, Gibraltar Strait, Straits right here, right? So you go around those straits, England's up around here. The island of England, uh, the, the British Islands are up here. So a lot of people kind of, some maps will place Tarshish here. Most likely though, it was actually up here. And so, and it was often called the end of the earth. So, so here, here we have Jonah coming from Gath Heifer, takes a trek down to Joppa, sails all the way across the, the, the Met, wants to sail all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, around Spain, up to the, the British Islands. In, that, in those days, it was that was considered like as far as you could go. I mean, he was going absolutely as far as he, he could go from where God told him to go. God said, go that way, and he went, no, I want to go that way. And you think about the cost of the fare to, to do that. So not only was he like, no, not doing it, he dropped a ton of money to go the opposite direction. It wasn't a small, you know, it wasn't a small thing to, to so he always had, had some money to go in a different direction, and, and, and he did, and he was, man, no God, I'm not going there. And so I just, I just wanted to, at this moment, I just wanted to kind of, we have a tendency to run from God, to run from obedience to God. He was a prophet. This was one of God's prophets who God spoke through. And he ran. And we, we have a tendency as human beings for whatever reason we, we come up with to run. We just have that tendency. God wants me to go there. My flesh is at enmity with God. And so I want to go there. And that's just a, that's a natural human thing. And so I just want you to think for a minute. What, not what, I'm not going to assume, are there any areas in your life right now that you're running in the opposite direction of God's call in your life? God has called me to do this. He's 
called me into a certain ministry, but I'm not going to. I'm going the other way. He's called me to forgive and work on a relationship that I don't want to. They hurt me. But he's called me to, to forgive and, and, and extend that forgiveness. But I, I don't know. I'm going that way. <laughs> so is, is there, think about that for a minute. Is there anything that you're <clears throat> running from the Lord in right now? I'll give us just about a minute here to just think. What running am I doing? You could have a legitimate reason why it makes sense to not do what God told you to do. You might, you know, you can justify it. And it, most people would say, yeah, that's, I mean, that makes sense. Why would you do that? I mean, put yourself into this situation. Go to your, your enemy who's hurt your people over and over. And we don't, we don't see it here, but Jonah knows here, based on what he tells us later in the book, you're just going to forgive him, God. I don't want that. I don't want that. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and laid down as was fastest and was fast asleep. Does that kind of remind you of Jesus sleeping? So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not, may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble up upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And so the next part is are, is are you sleeping? Sometimes we run and sometimes we sleep. We, we bury our head in the I don't want to think about this I don't like the way things are going I don't like whatever I'm irritated with whatever's going on I'm mad at the pastor I don't somebody didn't do something nice to the church and I'm just I'm just gonna forget about it I'm not gonna do anything I'm supposed to do because I'm just I'm not doing it because I've got reasons So I'm gonna, I found this, this was a, an interesting you know, tidbit I found from Goosey. Uh, Jonah slept in a place where he hoped no one would see him or disturb him. Sleeping Christians like to hide among the church. It's not that we're not going to church, not that we're not, not you know, showing up on Sunday and, you know, Tuesday and 
Thursday and everything else. But uh, are we really, are we sleeping? Jonah slept in a place where he could not help with the work that needed to be done. Sleeping Christians stay away from the work of the Lord. Are you, are you digging in? Are you taking part in the work? Are you uh, busy about his work? How much of your your time, your effort, your money, your, are you busy about his work? Jonah slept while there was a prayer meeting up on the deck. All these guys crying out to their own gods, oh, save us. Hey, Jonah, why don't you cry out to your God? Sleeping Christians don't like prayer meetings. Ouch. Sleeping Christians don't like prayer meetings. This is, for me, as anybody else, who's, have we been to the prayer meetings that we have here? We're having a, you know, first Friday of the month, we, we join, join together in prayer. There in several months. This one was interesting. I'm not casting any <laughs> any condemnation because it's sitting right on me. Jonah slept and had no idea of the problems around him. Sleeping Christians don't know what is really going on. Jonah slept when he was in great danger. Sleeping Christians are in danger, but don't know it. Jonah slept while the heathen needed him. Sleeping Christians snooze on while the world needs their message and testimony. Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping at work? Are you, you know, sleeping in your family? Not, not really being intentional about about uh, things you just kind of chug it along or, or are you busy about the work so he said to them I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land and you get the at least I get the impression in this I fear the Lord, that was more of a I'm a Christian type of thing. Because if he really feared the Lord in this moment, he wouldn't be running in the exact opposite direction to the end of the earth. He'd probably be doing what the Lord told him to do. So I fear the Lord is more like a label we like to put ourselves on. I go to church, I you know, it's you know I'm not really fearing the Lord here, I'm but I'm saying. The Lord, obviously here is um, capital L-O-R-D, so it's Yahweh uh, in, the, in the Hebrew there. So that's that's talking, that that's giving a the name of who he, who his God is. I fear, you know, he's not talking about some other God out there. God, there's many gods that that people worshipped. He's talking about Yahweh. I fear Yahweh, the God of the heaven, God of heaven. Who made the sea into dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do for you? The sea do to you that the sea may be calm for us. For the sea was growing more tempestuous. Tempestuous. He's growing more tempestuous. <laughs> and he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will be, become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Um, this is, I, I'm trying to think of a good way to. This is an example of <coughs> So we, we had one of our children who was who was who struggled was struggling with some sin. And, and they decided in that moment, 
rather than repenting of the sin to well I should I shouldn't be in this family I don't belong in this family and this is kind of the rather than repent of his sin just throw him in the board rather than let's turn around can you guys turn around I need to go back to to obey the Lord just just throw him in the water just and that's we have that tendency of you know we we have we have rejected what God has asked us to do and there's a the Lord's always always got an outstretched hand for us to repent always wants us to turn around to him but our flesh and Satan wants us to no nah, just just throw me in the sea just I don't I don't deserve it I don't you know I'm just a problem I'm just So, be aware of that. Be aware of that tendency of, of you know, you may have even rec recognized here that, that God was causing this problem, that God was still after him. And yet, he wasn't, his heart had not, uh, was not ready to obey him. He, he, was, he was still choosing separation. Just, just kill him. He didn't know there was going to be a fish. He didn't know that he was going to be in the belly of the fish for 30 days and spit out and then go. He, he just, just throw me in. Kill me. Kill me. I don't, just, just kill me. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return the land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. <laughs> Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord. They, they are now not praying to their gods. They are praying to Yahweh. Right? So they, they're saying, We pray, O Lord, Please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with the innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they decided to not take Jonah's advice initially and say, you know, we're just going to try to get to shore. We'll let him off there. We'll be on our merry way. The guy was having none of it. I don't. We. This is conjecture, but my my, my my thought process is if they would have turned around to go back to where God had told them to go, that the sea may have calmed. I, I don't know that for sure, but I, I I suspect that. But they were just trying to get rid of him and move on. God was having none of that. He, he, his desire was for, for Jonah to repent and, and to obey and turn back to him. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. I just imagine this scene. They're like, God, we feel like you brought us to this. And they're just, you know, the boat's just, bam, done. The whole, just calm. Again, kind of brings you back to, obviously, a, a different circumstance. But a similarity to what happened when Jesus just rebuked the storm and the sea was calm. Right? <coughs> so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared Yahweh exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. I don't know that this is a conversion, but it sure seems like it. There's some they 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 weren't praying to their God, they were fearing the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. They were fearing the God of Jonah who just in front of their eyes come to see. Like that. 
and they made sacrifices to him and they took vows to him. I don't know that's conversion. It sure, sure seems like it. And I think it's, I think it's a, a, a cool picture of the fact that it's a cool picture and a warning that God will get his glory whether you obey or not. His glory is not, is not dependent on your obedience. These people were brought to God when Jonah disobeyed and God even used that situation in continued disobedience to reach these, these mariners, these sailors. He reached them. He had grace on them. And even though Jonah didn't do what he was supposed to do. This is, this is a good God doing a good thing even when his his person wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And, it, and it, I think also serves as a warning to us that just because something good, some fruit was, was brought out of a certain situation that we were involved in doesn't mean that we were being obedient to God. It means that God is good and sovereign over all and in control. Sometimes we like to say, well, this good thing came out of it, so God, God, God was in it, right? Yeah, God was in it, but that doesn't mean you were being obedient. We can't make an excuse for our disobedience because God made something good out of it anyway. Does that make sense? You guys tracking? Because God made it. These guys, had Jonah not disobeyed, would these guys have ever had, I don't know again that this is a conversion, but these guys may never have come to the Lord. They would never have this. So God made a good thing out of that. Because God is good. So God gets the glory, not Jonah's disobedience. The same goes for when we are running from God and he does something good anyway. We can't pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, see, the Lord was in it, see? Right? Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days or three nights. That little verse right there, makes Jonah one of, the, one of the most controversial books of the Bible. As you know, we like to say, because and, and really it goes back to just like Kevin said this week, Genesis 1 1, you know, if you if you get lost to Genesis 1 1, in the beginning was God. Sorry, in, sorry, in the beginning God. You know that he was there. In the beginning God. He was there, and he created everything, right? If you get lost there, then this verse becomes a problem. But if you recognize that God created everything, it's not any big thing for him to make a special fish that enables a person to survive in for, 30, for three days. It's nothing. I mean, it's just nothing. He made a whole planet that seven billion people survive on. You know, he, 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 it's not a big deal for so. It's not controversial unless you have chosen the supernatural, chosen to believe, believe that the supernatural is somehow not possible. But there is, our very existence requires the supernatural. That, that we exist at all requires that something outside of us created it, right? And so as long as you can figure that out, that in the beginning God, he wasn't part of it. In the beginning, there was God. And then he created everything. This isn't a problem. This is, this is a big, this is no big deal that God decided to build a fish, whether it's a whale or a, you know, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. He just created, had to be a big fish, had to be somehow Jonah was able to survive in the belly for whether that, whether it was miraculously he didn't need to breathe for, or miraculously there was a, oxygen air sac in there or who knows it's not that it doesn't it doesn't require a major amount of controversy unless you don't recognize that God is supernatural 
That is by by the very essence of who he is. He is supernatural. He is outside of nature. He is above nature, supernatural. He is constrained by the constraints of nature. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And so we don't know if the, the mariners saw Jonah get, get swallowed. We don't know if he started to sink and he got swallowed, or if it's as he's falling in. You know, who knows? You can imagine all sorts of things may happen. But needless to say, Jonah was swallowed by by a great fish. And we'll hear next week about you know what the Lord does at that time and, and the and the work that He does on Jonah's heart during that time. And, and though it's not a you know, there's still work to be done by the time Jonah's through this section of his life. The Lord had to do some work here and had to bring him low, literally <laughs> low in the sea uh, to get him to obey. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, again for your word. I thank you, God, for uh, this picture of, of Jonah uh, and of how he ran from obeying you and how you pursued him. And Lord, how he um, seemed to be avoiding your pursuit of him. God, I just pray, Lord, for each of us, God, that you would, um, that as we look around and there's storms in our own lives, is there, Lord, would you, would you help us not ignore them? Would you help us, Lord, to, uh, to see what's going on around us? Is there, Disobedient in our, in our lives that's causing the storm? Is there a running going on? I pray, God, that you would continue pursuing us, Lord, until we turn around. Uh, I pray, God, for each of my brothers here that you would, and to me, that you would not allow us to, to have to go to rock bottom to hear your voice and to turn around. We just thank you, Lord, that you have grace. We thank you, Lord, that, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us, and he came willingly. You sent Jonah um, to a sinful people that he did not know, and yet you forgave in both instances. God, that you help us, Lord, to, to share your message, to desire to uh, be about your business at work, and play, and home, and at church. Lord, help us not to be distracted and build up excuses for why we can avoid obedience. Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have about 15 minutes if anybody wants to